This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. This episode is sponsored by C-School, the online school for creativity training. If you'd like to unleash your creative potential and access a free creativity blueprint training series, then just head over to c.school. That's www.c.school for your free training series. In today's interview, I speak with Jerry Acuff, and we talk about why the best salespeople are introverts, the three reasons people don't buy, and the pillars of sales. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to welcome onto the show Jerry Acuff. Jerry is the founder and CEO of Delta Point, a consulting firm that has worked with 15 of the top 100 companies in the world on selling and marketing excellence to drive revenue. Regarded as one of the top 15 sales experts in the world, he is the author of four business books, including The Relationship Edge in Business and Stop Acting Like a Seller, Start Thinking Like a Buyer. It's my great pleasure to have Jerry join us today. So welcome, Jerry. Thanks, James. It's exciting to be here. So share with everyone what's going on in your world just now. Well, we're, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of consulting for, you know, uh, big companies. Uh, and, uh, and the biggest thing we do is help them with products that are hard to sell. And um, we've developed sort of an expertise on if you have a product that's stagnant or getting competition, you know, what do you do about it? And so we've, we've got a process that we use and we've done 160 of these projects and we've been successful 159 times. <laughs> so we're pretty good at changing people's trajectory in terms of revenue and market share uh, if we believe in the product. I mean, that's one of the decisions we make is, you know, is this something we can believe in? Oh, Zig Ziglar said, Selling is a transference of feeling, and you can't transfer a feeling you don't have. So I always say to myself, I'm going to evaluate the products myself to see if it's something I can believe in. If I can believe it, we can teach people to sell it. The other thing is I launched a, um, a virtual training program called Jerry Acuff VT, and it's simply everything I know about four things. Um, one is, you know, when I started my career, I was an, I was an am shy and introverted and my first two sales jobs, I sucked at, I was awful. Uh, I actually quit the, uh, both of them. One, I didn't have to quit. The guy fired me after three months of selling life insurance. And the second one, I quit after seven months because I literally would spend an hour getting up the courage to get out of the car and go call on customers. And so I said to myself, you know, this is not me. I can't, I'm not a pushy and aggressive person. And so I went to work for a, um, went back into coaching uh, American football and, um, and, and I wanted to be a college coach, but I got rejected from graduate school at Northeast Louisiana University, which is not Harvard. I mean, it's a fairly, you know, it's not nearly as hard to get into. And so I realized that I had to do something. And, and so I got a job in a pharmaceutical business, uh, which I thought was PR. Well, my boss thought differently. He thought it was sales. And the thing that was wonderful was that he taught me how to be successful being me, being an introvert. Uh, and so I became reasonably successful as a rep got promoted to manager and then drove down the, the road one day and said to myself, okay, you have to teach 10 people how to sell and you don't know how to do it. You know how to do it, but you don't know how to teach somebody to do it. And I read a book that changed my life. It's called Winning Strategies and Selling by Roger Staubach and Jack and Gary Kinder. And it's not a great book. My book's better. Uh, but, uh, in that book, he said this, he said, chances are you'll be the same person five years from today that you are today with the exception of two things, the people you meet and the books you read and the person who won't read is truly no better off than the person who can't read. Now I had been out of college at that point in time in 10 years and I had read three books. I read Jaws. I read QB seven by Leon Uris. 
uh, and I read The Godfather in anticipation of moving to New Jersey. <laughs> and uh, so I, I realized I was functionally illiterate. So I started reading and I've read 590 business books since then. I've read one book 70 times. I do 100 book summaries a year. Um, and, 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 and I would tell you that what he said in that book is the abject truth. One, it's not only the books you read. And nowadays, James, honestly, you don't need to read books. You need a good book summary. You need to you need to subscribe to half a dozen blogs, and you can do it in a fraction of the time that I did it. Now I still read twenty five books a year, um, and so you know that that was an epiphany for me. And so I became uh, you know the number one sales manager in my company very quickly. Uh, first person under forty to become what they call a senior district manager in the history of the company, and then I woke up running the company. So I wound up as vice president, general manager. So I went from, you know, being an introvert who couldn't sell to being someone who ran a sales organization. Uh, and two things attributed to that. One was stalled back. The second one was an audio tape I listened to by a guy named Fred Herman. And Fred Herman had a series of audio tapes called Keep It Simple Salesperson. And in there, he said, the, the thing that's wrong with most people who are not good at selling is they have the wrong definition of selling and he said if you have this definition of selling you will never see yourself as pushy and aggressive he said selling is two things selling is teaching in every successful sale some education takes place i learned something i didn't know before the second thing he said selling is finding out what people want and helping them get it he said now there are two things about that that are true number one most people don't know what they want but they think they do the second one is people want what you don't have. You have no right to sell them what you do have. So after reading that, I said, I can do that. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a person who I don't really care whether you buy or not. In fact, in my book, I say the less you care about the sale, the more you sell. What you have to care about is being really good at your job, really understanding how do you make your call interesting? How do you ask questions that provoke thought? How do you tell your story with emotion and logic so that the person is connected because they understand that you understand their pain point? How do you handle the questions and the objections that they give, which are real? And then how do you actually uh, ask for the business? I, I, I've created a, a process and a methodology for closing built on my strategy for asking girls out for date in high school. And the way I did that is I would never ask anybody that I didn't know was going to say yes. And so I would ask somebody else, ask, you know, Linda, if Eileen will go out with me. And if Eileen said yes, then I'd ask Eileen. So I create a closing uh, process that sort of mimics that. So when, in our closing process, nobody says no. Everybody says yes. But they either say yes or they say yes, but. Now, yes, but is no, but it takes you back into the selling process. So anyway, that's probably more than you want to know. But I sucked at selling, and then I became one of the world's best sales experts. Um, and I did it as an introvert, and I that hasn't changed. You know, now I have, you know, introvert is a temperament. It's not a personality. And there are gradations of, 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 of introversion. And you can situationally teach yourself to be extroverted. Now, when I speak to 1,000 people or 5,000 people or 300 people, I am extremely extroverted. But I have trained myself to give those speeches and be funny. And But as soon as that thing's over, I want to go to my room and be by myself. But I think I think that's great for people to hear as well that you can be a great salesperson and be be consider yourself mostly an introvert because you know I, I think it's interesting you know you you're a speaker as well and you speak on on stages and you know the, the, one of the ones I, I I it used to really frustrate me I would hear people in the music industry one of the industries I I originally come from and they would say oh well well I, I'm I'm an I'm an artist I can't be a I can't be a salesperson. And then I would say, well, do you realize that, you know, the, whether it's the Bruce Springsteen that's up there on stage, they have this introverted part of them, which is when they're, they're writing and they're creating, but then they right. get up into, in front of a stage in front of 10,000, 50,000 people and, you know, something else happens as well. And do you really right. believe that they got where they got to 
just by being just wonderful craftsperson and just doing and not telling anyone about it. So I think it's great that, right. you, that you're really you know, open. It's like you can, even if you're if you're watching, listening to this just now, and you feel like I'm I'm an introvert. I I I, I don't feel I have the the the, uh, the temperament to sell. Then you you obviously you've kind of got that process you've created. So one thing I was I was going to ask you as you were, you were talking through that is you mentioned a couple of names there. One at the start there was was Zig Ziglar. As you were you were going on your journey to really learning about how to not just be a, a great salesperson, but how to teach other people and to train other people to be great at sales. Who were those mentors for you that you had? You mentioned that you obviously books you were reading, but were there any other people that you you really admired? Do you like the way that they built their business, or you like the way that they they had an approach to sales? I got really lucky. I had for the first fourteen years I was in the pharmaceutical business. I had the three. Uh, best bosses in the history of the world. Uh, and they were my mentors. And what's interesting is that the first one was the guy who hired me. And then my next boss was his boss because he and I became colleagues. And then my next boss had also been trained by the second guy. So all of this really can be traced to one person, a guy named Gene Vesna. And Gene was a person who taught you as a leader uh, to take risk, to go against the grain. If your gut said go against the grain, the first person I hired uh, failed the test, flunked the final exam, and on the first four days that he was with me in the field would not make a call. And within two years, he was the number one rep in the country. And the test said, do not hire this guy. My boss said, look, it's your your decision. You decide to hire the guy, then, then you hire the guy. And so I did. And he became... I think probably the, as good a salesperson as ever been in the pharmaceutical business. What did you see in him? Just that, that, that one there. What did you see in that person? That everyone else had, had discounted and the, 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 uh, the, the survey, the study that the person had done, they flunked it. But what did you personally see in that person that gave you a hope? He did things no one else did. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Number one, when I got his resume, I rate resumes A, B, and C. A means I got a C, a B means maybe, C means never. His was a C. So I don't, I have no interest in interviewing him. He calls my home 10 times to talk to my wife. And my wife finally calls me and says, hey, you need to call this guy. And I said, well, he sounds like a pest to me. So I said, I'll blow him off. And so... Um, the first place, I don't know how he got my number because I didn't put my number anywhere, but so it was obviously fairly, you know, um, Ingenious. <laughs> adventurous. <laughs> and so uh, my wife said, well, now you be very nice to him because he's very nice. So I call him on the phone and I, and I, I told my whole intention is to blow him off. And I said, uh, John, um, you know, the truth is a guy, you know, I'm not hiring anybody with your, your level of inexperience. I, I'm just not. And so, you, you know, maybe one of these days when you've got some sales experience, I'll, I'll talk to you. And he said, well, I understand why you'd want to hire, you know, someone with more experience. But I have to tell you, uh, if you learn a little bit about me, you'll find out that I have the experience of any 30 year old you've ever met. He was 23 at the time. And then he explains to me all this experience he's got he started working at a drugstore at 12 he's now 23 in his second job he's doing two jobs is he's running the drugstore so he's gone from he paid for his own high school education he paid to go to private school he paid for his own college um he bought his own car he bought his own clothes ever since he was 16 years old <clears throat> and he said to me as he tells me at the interview all of this stuff and i'm saying well, I got to see this guy again. So I see him a second time and I decide to say no. So I literally call him on a Friday night and I tell him that I have decided to go with another candidate. Now, I had not offered her the job, but I was going to offer her the job that day. So on Saturday, I go to my mailbox. There are five letters in my mailbox. Now, all of these letters had to have been written before, you know, I told this guy no. One was from the governor of Alabama. <laughs> Okay. One was from the owner of the largest independent drug chain, and we were in the drug business, pharmaceutical business, uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, where he lived. One was from the doctor who would be his biggest customer. One was from the vice president of a dairy. Uh, and one was from the president of Auburn University. 
Now, I had gone to a school with 1,500 students, 1,200 students, and I couldn't get to suit the president of that university to remember my name. This guy's got the president writing letters about him. So I said to myself, I made a big mistake here. Anybody, and, and all of the letters said the same thing, James. You are a functional moron if you don't hire this guy. This is the most unusual man we've ever met. And so I said, two people tell you're drunk, lay down. So I called him the next day and I said, look, I uh, think I've made a mistake. And uh, I'm not sure I'm going to hire you, but I'm going to interview you again. Well, now I am, you know, I am going to hire the guy. And so I did hire him. He flunked the finally, he flunked the test. He flunked the final exam. He wouldn't make a call. And, and let, me, let me tell you this lesson because this one's powerful. I go down there to, 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 to teach him how to sell when he comes back from training. And at the end of the first call, he looks at me and he says, I can't do that. I said, you can't do what? He said, I can't do what you just did. I said, why not? He said, that's not my style. I said, look, pal, you got no style. I'm here to give you style. That's my, that's my job. He said, well, I'm telling you, I can't do that. So for four, three consecutive days after every call, he wouldn't make a call. He said to me, that's not my style. And to say, at the end of the second day, I said, look, stop saying that. I understand this ain't your style. So on Friday or Thursday night, I decided to go home. And, and figure out a way to fire him. Uh, because, and I actually told him in Selma, Alabama, I said, I never contemplated in my life that the first person I hired would be such a difficult person to work with. And he said, I just keep telling you that's not my style. So I said, okay. So I'm thinking, all right, and I got, he said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, well, call me next Friday. So I'm thinking I got eight days to figure out how to fire him. And I got to try and fire him because everybody told me not to hire him. And even my boss said, I wouldn't hire him, but you hire him. So anyway, make a long story short, he said, well, what do you want me to do while I'm gone? I said, well, why don't you go get some orders? We just launched a new product. Well, I was number one in the country, and my average sales rep, average, was doing $5,000 a month because the product was brand new. So he calls me the next Friday, and he says, um, what do you want me to do with these orders? I said, what orders are you talking about? He said, well, you told me to go get orders. I said, well, how much is it? He said, $26,000. I said, I like your style. <laughs> but you see, it was the greatest management lesson I ever got. Because you see what he was saying to me was, that's, he, he wasn't saying to me, and, and it, was, it was instantaneous in my mind. He wasn't saying to me, that's not my style. What he was saying is, don't make me you. Let me be me. And what I realized at that time, and I came to realize, see, I didn't really become a sales expert until I became a manager, until it became my responsibility to teach salespeople. That's when I learned, okay, if you study extra introverts, introverts are natural sales greatness. They have natural curiosity. They're terrific listeners. They ask great questions. They think before they speak. They're not interested in, 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 in themselves. They're interested in you. What the hell is that but a great salesperson? Almost everybody I know who makes seven figures income is an introvert. And so he taught me that what I needed to do was to find a way to bring out the greatness in everybody I hired, not try and make them me. And it was the greatest management lesson I could give. And he's my best friend in the world today. That's a wonderful story. I, I absolutely love that story. And um, that's great. I mean, I, I, because when you hear things like that, it, it gives you some some uh, some hope uh, as well that, uh, you know, because we're often now we're told oh, you need to be exactly like such and such. And there's this you know fear of missing out. You need to be exactly like this. But th this person, they, they obviously learned from you that they were, you know, the some of the key kind of principles of selling kind of what you were right. telling them, but they kind of, they found, they, they found their own, they found their own style. Uh, you know, you, you would be able to kind of pull that out of them. Right. I had a fifth grade math teacher. I hired a woman who hadn't worked in 10 years. I hired um, a guy who was a buyer for JC pennies of the 20 people I hired in eight years. <clears throat> I only hired one person who had pharmaceutical sales experience. I hired 19 people. None of them had pharmaceutical sales experience. Of the 20 people I hired, 19 of the 20 were in the top 50 out of 650 within two years. 13 of them got promoted. The, the only one that did not make the top 50, I fired after three weeks. 
So if you stayed with me longer than a month, you were guaranteed to be in the top 8% of the company. Now, as you've been building your own career uh, as, a, as a consultant, as a speaker, as, as an author, can you tell us about a time when you worked on a project uh, and you gave it your heart and your soul, you gave it your all, but it didn't work out like you'd hoped? And more importantly, what was the lesson that you took from that experience? Uh, I mean, actually, it's something I'm working on now. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how do I sell my online training program. And <clears throat> I've already recouped my in investment because our clients are buying it. But selling on the Internet is co something completely different. And so I've, I've spent a considerable amount of money trying to market this program, what I, what I would say uh, not much success at all, marketing it online. And so I had this big epiphany last week. <clears throat> I teach this thing like, how do you get great at selling? It's fundamentally three things. It's knowledge, it's messaging, and it's relationships. So now what's funny, when I do uh, uh, seminars or speeches and I ask people, which of these three do you think I think is most important? Well, I've written three books on relationship building, so they all say relationship building, which is kind of funny. But I say, no, the most of the important of these is knowledge. I said, first place, if you have knowledge, nobody wants a relationship with an idiot. I want a relationship with someone who has some expertise, right? And if you have a relationship, then, I mean, if you have knowledge, then you know how to message. You can't message what you don't know. So I realized my issue is I don't know nearly enough about online marketing. I don't know anything about it. And so I'm going back to school. I'm 69 years old. I'm going back to school. I found a, a program, which I think is fantastic, which will teach me everything I need to know. Now, I've sold, you know, six figures of, of my virtual training program. But, you know, as one of the top sales experts in the world and someone who tells to teaches people, how do you achieve extraordinary goals? How do, you, how do you go from being a district manager to running a company in four years? How do you build one of the international, we were last two years in a row, international strategic advisory firm of the year in the biopharmaceutical business? I, well, this year we were brand of the year uh, as a consulting company. How do you do that? You can't do that by just ordinary goal setting. You have to have extraordinary goal setting. The book I've read 70 times is Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. That and that's nice. about... How do you activate your goal-seeking mechanism? So I teach all of that, and I teach it in 22 minutes. The second thing I teach is, how do you build a relationship with someone you don't naturally connect with? Now, the truth is, we don't naturally connect with about 75% of the people we meet. Yet, those people are very important to our success. And so, how do you connect with those people? I mean, if I connect with you, like we obviously do, I don't need a damn book. But if I don't connect with you and you're important to my success, I teach you how to do that. And I can teach you with a very high degree of success. I can teach you how to see people who won't see you. Um, when, all of those things are, are in my virtual training. We teach how do you sell without being pushy and aggressive. Half of the world is in sales, not because they want to, because they couldn't find another job. And most of them are turned off by the sales techniques that they're being taught because it's the antithesis of who they are. They're not pushing aggressive people. They're wonderful people. What I teach you is how do you be you? How do you just be yourself and be great at selling? Now you can't do it without understanding the fundamentals. And then the last thing we teach is how do you, uh, how do you teach selling? The first thing that I, I had to learn, how do you teach this to somebody else? And we do that with, you know, exquisite detail. And so, uh, you know, what I'm doing is I'm going back to school. I mean, I'm going back to where I should have started a year ago. I should have had enough sense. So I was stupid. You know, I, 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 I mean, like an idiot. I thought, well, I'm, you know, top expert in the world. People are going to read this. They're going to buy it. That's idiotic. So my stupidity is my problem. But one of the stories you mentioned uh, earlier was this idea that you kind of think of it almost like dating, getting, getting a date. You know, that is super interesting. Right. And actually, I, was, I kind of chuckled there because one of the best online marketers I know, uh, Ryan Dice, who has a great company called Digital Marketer based out in Texas, you know, real thought leader when it comes to online marketing. That is the same story he uses when it comes to online marketing in terms of you would never go and do that 16 year old thing of like just going straight in, straight in asking for the date 
You know, you would never go and ask right. Street for a sale. You know, and he said exactly. he, he thinks about how that's applied in the online world, which is slightly different from the from the offline world in terms of right. how, in terms of application. But in terms of principles about where you kind of come from, you know, your 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 stance is actually very very similar. Yeah, but yeah, I think the other problem is arrogance. You know, two years in a row, I was named the best pharmaceutical marketing CEO in North America. And so, you know, you convince yourself that, you know, you know, marketing. Well, the truth is marketing online is so dramatically different than marketing, you know, sort of one on one in the business that I'm I'm in. And so I think a lot of it is 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 poor self-awareness. You know, I call it arrogance. I don't think it's really because I don't believe I'm arrogant, but I had poor self-awareness. And I, I, I do believe that the key to all growth and development is self-awareness. And so I was not self-aware. I'm going back to school. I'm already about, you know, I guess a tenth of the way through this training course. And I've already got 10 ideas that I didn't have that if I'd have had them a year ago, they wouldn't have cost me a quarter of a million dollars. Now, you mentioned one of the things that you're brought in a lot to do is, is, is teaching how to sell difficult products, you know, products which are not right. your top line, the, the well-known, the, you know, the ones that probably a lot of the salespeople will gravitate towards because they, they, they almost kind of can sell themselves, those difficult products. Right. Uh, how did you arrive at uh, a sense of how to kind of do that? Was, was there a particular kind of aha moment you had in, in thinking about that, that's a challenge and that's a big challenge for lots and lots of companies. Yeah, the big, cha- the, the big challenge I had in the, in, the, in the problem with most of my customers is they don't understand how their customers think. So that's why I wrote the book, Stop Acting Like a Seller, Start Thinking Like the Buyer. Well, how does the buyer, I, I, for example, I had a product we, we did for one of the top 15 countries companies in the world, had an 18 share. They were convinced they'd have a 40 share. Each share points $10 million. So they're basically $220 million behind their projections. And they brought me in. Um, and, you know, and I said to myself, I, you know, first place, I, I don't take the project unless I a, find out what have you already done? Because if you've already done what I'm going to do, then it doesn't make any sense to hire me. So I asked them some questions and they gave us the business and we took their share from 18 to 52 in nine months. But it was very simple. Uh, now, it took us probably 60 days to figure it out because we had to really understand what my friend John Carr, who's one of the brightest people in the world at understanding customers. John calls it the, the mental room. What's in the mental room? And what this company didn't understand is that the physicians believed that these products were virtually the same. And so what we taught them to say was uh, p- physicians are starting to look at this product differently. Now, if you say that to a doctor, what do you think they're going to say? Well, how? You know, they're, they're going to want to know more. They're inquisitive, curious people. How much simpler is it than that? And it doesn't matter, you know, what product you're talking about. If you say people are starting to look at this differently, my natural curiosity and my fear of loss are going to cause me to want to know what it is. Well, that puts me into the conversation that I want to have. And so I would say, well, uh, the truth is when these products came out, I think physicians thought same thing I thought, which was these products are fundamentally the same. I said, but I think what they're realizing now is that these products are similar, but they're not the same. Now, let me tell you something. If your audience doesn't latch onto that phrase, if they're in sales, they're crazy. Because the truth is, if I say that, then what's the question the customer wants to ask me? Well, how are they different? Well, what the hell kind of discussion do you think I want to have? And you're now you're going into features and, and you're going into benefits and you're going into all those things, the places you want to go with someone. Yeah, and I, well, in, in this case, I asked him, I said, well, uh, you mentioned that you had 10 patients on this other drug. Is that is that true? He said, yes. And I said, well, um, what percentage of these patients, if you had to guess, are going to have an adverse event? And he said, all of them. And I said, okay, what percentage of these patients, if they have an adverse event, it'll be a bad deal for you? And he said, three. I said, so three of the 10, if they have an adverse event, it's not a good deal for you because they've got other stuff going on. He said, yeah. I said, those are people you should have put on our product. And he said, why? And I said, well, let me tell you why. And then I explained to him the differences in our product. So I walked in with a zero share, left with the 30 share, and then ultimately, after he got started using the product, it was the only thing he used. 
and the share again went from 18 to 52 by getting the company to understand that you have to get them to want to know what's different. You gotta make them ask you questions. What we do is go in and talk. And what I do is go in and say, number one, there's three reasons people don't buy from you. Number one, you talk too much. If you survey customers, 95% of customers say sales reps talk too much. The second reason people don't buy is because they don't think you understand them. Well, how could you understand them if all you're doing is talking? The third thing, they, the reason they don't buy is they think you're biased. And if I think you're biased, then I'm going to discount everything you say. So we teach our clients, how do you make sure that you don't sound biased? And it's the easiest thing in the world to teach. You don't need to go through my course. I'll teach it to you right now. Our product, our service is not for everybody. That should be the opening on every call you make. Our product, our service is not for everybody. The real question is, is it a decent fit for you? And I won't know that until I ask you some questions. Is that okay? And I've immediately eliminated my bias. I, I love this because there's so much, pa you know, and this is, you're kind of getting into the craft also, you know, th those 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 phrases which have deep they're 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 rooted in deep human psychology uh right. as well but um i love that and, and then you're able to kind of teach it teach it at scale i want as we kind of start to finish up up here um i'd love to know from you is there an, um you mentioned your your uh your kind of vt uh, product your training product but is there any other kind of online um tools online resources mobile apps that you find very useful for, for doing the work that you do well, I'm actually developing an app that I'm going to introduce in the next probably six weeks for Android and I iPhone called Really Linked. You know, there's a gazillion people on LinkedIn. And the truth is, um, I have 8,200 LinkedIn connections, uh, and all of them are important. But there's only about 80 of them that are crucial to my success. And one of the things that we know is that if you don't stay in touch with people, you lose influence. So I created an app called Really Linked. Who do you really want to be linked to? So you download those people into my app, and you can call them, text them, email them, or, or send them a message that asks for a meeting. And every time you do that, it keeps a record of, of how you contacted them when. And you can set reminders. So I want to call you once a month. I want to call you every other week. I want to call you next Friday at 345, and those reminders show up. And then when you hit those reminders, it takes you directly to the screen, which enables you to call them, text them, email them, and you never have to go into another part of your phone. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't capture incoming calls, but only outgoing. The other thing it has is a place for writing notes. So it's fundamentally CRM light for free. And so I developed it because I suck at keeping in touch with people. So I said to myself, uh, I got this idea from a basketball coach who writes 120 people, who stays in touch with 120 people. And as I began to look for a technology solution, I couldn't find one. So really linked helps me. Waze, I couldn't live without Waze because Waze teaches me how to go from here to there. Uh, LinkedIn is absolutely crucial. Uh, Facebook is crucial. Google is in, invaluable. Um and I would say, uh, you know, in Instagram and Twitter, I mean, I use all of those. Um, and all of those are, I think, an important part of your business because, you know, the Grant Cardone says, uh, you know, people don't buy from you unless they know you. And people, the only way people can know you online is you have to have a significant presence online. You have to build that awareness. I think those are the ones that are most, the most useful for me. Now, you mentioned a lot of books earlier. If there was one book uh that you could recommend to people it can't be one of yours we're gonna have links to your books here uh people to check out but a book by someone else what would that book be it would probably be paul cherry's book questions that sell the thing that makes great salespeople great is they ask great questions now the difference between paul's book and my book paul teaches you how to ask great questions uh, and, and, and you can't read his book and not come away with five questions you ought to be asking customers. My book teaches you how to build your own questions so that people want to answer and answer truthfully. We know that 20% of the time, uh, people aren't telling you everything that's, you know, they're like icebergs, you know, they're telling you just what's over the surface. We teach people how to get to the essence of what they're really thinking by how you build the question. 
But I would say, you know, if I had to read one book, I, you know, I'd probably also say, you know, Og Mandino's book, which is the greatest salesman in the world, which has sold more copies than any other sales book ever. And uh, it's got a religious overtone to it. So if you don't like that, don't read it. Uh, but it's 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 absolutely unbelievable. It's a great book. And then, if you were to recommend one album uh, to people, is, is there is there a particular album that, that you're you're a big fan of? You mean like a podcast? Yeah, in, uh, like an album, like a music a music album. What would that album be? Oh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I love music. I mean, I, I exercise every morning to my to my iPod, and you know, and I shuffle the thing, and I listen to all kinds of songs. Uh, but it, you know, I, I guess your folks would like that. It would be anything by Tom Jones. <laughs> Great My artist. favorite song in the entire world is "It's Not Unusual," and I could listen to that a thousand times. Now, just to show you how eclectic and stupid I am, my next favorite song is "Amarilla by Morning" by George Strait. <laughs> so <laughs> I range from George Strait to Tom Jones, but "It's Not Unusual" uh, is best song i ever heard wonderful great um and i'm gonna leave you kind of final question here as we finish up i want you to imagine that you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch so you have all the knowledge all the skills that you've acquired over the years but no one knows you you know no one you have to restart what would you do how would you restart things well i think you know one of my really good friends i mentor four college basketball coaches in america and two of them are two of the top 20 there are and I do it for free and I do it for fun. But one of them asked me to, to send them a list of the 25. They didn't say 25. They said, what do you wish you knew at 42? And I did this when I was, I think, uh, 62. And the first one is relationships are everything. I, I would find a way to go out and build relationships. I would leverage the relationships I have because even if I woke up tomorrow and I didn't have anything and I didn't know anybody, I would find some people to meet. I would go to a Rotary Club or I'd go to a Civitan Club or I'd go to, uh, you know, I'd, I'd go do something where I could meet people and I would want to meet people that are more successful than me. And then I'd want to build a valuable business relationship with them, which is what I teach in my book. And the way you do that is with persistent, consistent, predictable actions. And secondly, it's with unexpected, thoughtful acts. Most people don't have a clue what an unexpected, thoughtful act is. But it's one of the most powerful relationship building techniques that you would ever learn. Wonderful. So you've shared so much genius with us on this, so much knowledge. I'm really thankful for it. If people want to continue this to learn more from you, uh, to check out your training, your books and other things, where's the best place for them to go and learn about that? Uh, JerryAcuff.com. Jerry, J-E-R-R-Y-A-C-U-F-F.com. And then, you know, there's stuff there. The other thing is I got a bunch of, you know, free videos on YouTube. I think I got 50 something videos on YouTube. Uh, my blog, you know, I, I, that, that story I told you about that first hire, when I put that story on LinkedIn, it got 21,000 views. Uh, and so, you know, LinkedIn is a good place to follow me. I do a podcast every two weeks. Uh, I write a blog uh, once a week. Um, so, you know, I mean, if anybody wants to learn from me, you can learn a boatload from me from just going to either jerryacuff.com or going to uh, YouTube and, and just checking out Jerry Acuff and you'll get a bunch of videos on a lot of stuff that's deeper than you and I talked about today. Great. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm going to put all those links here below and I wish you all the best with all your, your future projects. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, James, for having me. I appreciate it. It's an honor. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.